Hello there. My name is Jason Crable, and I'm the new Executive Director of the Decorative Arts Center of Ohio here in Lancaster. I want to welcome you to uh, this virtual curator talk of our new exhibition, uh, Russian Decorative Arts from the Tsars to the USSR. Uh, we're so excited to be able to share this uh, tour with you. We look forward to being able to do it in person, but in the meantime, I think you'll really enjoy this, uh, this walk and talk through the exhibition. The, uh, the exhibit's curator is Michael Rees. Uh, Michael has nearly 40 years of experience in the commercial furniture industry. His passion is helping clients explore art with the needs and aesthetics of their environments. In 2015, he started his art consultancy business to serve clients local and international. I don't want to take too much time. I want to be able to turn it over to Michael. Um, but I did want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, the Ohio Arts Council, the Fox Foundation, and the Johns family for helping, to, uh, helping us to put on this, uh, this exhibit. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to Michael. Hi, my name is Michael Reese, and thank you for joining us today to see this exhibition of From the Tsar to the USSR. Throughout the rooms, you will see not only decorative arts that were inspired by the time, but also fashion, which I hoped to kind of uh, help set the timetable or the vision of what was happening uh, at that time period. In this room, uh, the first room which kind of is dedicated to the Tsar and that time period, the beginning of uh, the 19th century, you know, of course with the, the images of the, the Tsar and the Tsar's family to under cups and the samovar and how, how people entertained, as it were. First, I'd like to say that the piece to my right, the original is hanging in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, Moscow. I acquired it over 20 years ago, and the only thing that makes it not a forgery is that on her wrist would be a bracelet. The one thing about the about Russian artists back in the day, back in the 90s, is that they learned to copy the masters. They had all the great works there at the Hermitage, and many people like my parents and myself saw pieces, we would have them commissioned, and the Russians believed that that you have to master the, the masters of how they did everything before you can break all the rules to then create your own work. Uh, it's also one of the first, I would say not necessarily an important piece, but really a good piece of art that I ever purchased because I used to uh, quite often and buy lots of things. And my friend David once said, have you ever thought about buying one good piece? I'm like, ugh, one good piece. So, this was the first good piece I ever purchased, and I'm so happy, I love it. The next thing I'd like to chat about are the icons that are off to the left. Back in the day, back during the communist era, uh, icons were not valued. So you would go along the streets, and people have you know, this layout of fabric or burlap, and you'd see icons of undercups and uh, cigarettes or different mechanical pieces that you had even no idea what they were. And so those icons were like $5, $8, different amounts. And you know, they're from the 1800s. You could tell they, they've been prayed and touched and touched. And so I was just buying lots of those uh, as souvenirs. As you would have a tchotchke, right? It's five bucks, like seven dollars. What does it matter? At the same time, I did realize that nothing from 1960 was permitted to take be taken out of Russia. And understand Russia at that time period was you know, Poland and the Czech Republic and the, uh, the Baltic states. I mean, it was a, a vast area. So I accumulated these things in those different areas. And uh, about 10 years ago, uh, in Cincinnati, there was the Antique Road Show in front of where I was going. And he kind of laid them all out for them. And the gentleman from the Hermitage, you know, he knew the story, but I, I paid five dollars, seven dollars. He's shaking his head. He's, that's right. He said, but uh, now they're about five hundred to fifteen hundred dollars each. And I was like, ugh, I gave a lot of those away. I hope they didn't throw them away uh, as souvenirs. Um, and I kind of shared that because 
I think what you see throughout this exhibition, what one day is so prized, so revered, so prayed to, you know, 10 years later, it's, it's on the street for $5. And then 20 years later, all of a sudden, it has this great value again. There's an old saying that goes, when someone sneezes in America, Europe catches a cold. Well, that's what happened here. So in 1905, Russia had its own little mini revolution that the Tsar was able to tap down. But then 1914, the war started between Russia, Germany, and the Ottoman Empire. But keep in mind that in 1917, Lenin caused a revolt. And so during this First World War, you also had the Russian Revolution happening within their own borders. And what I find fascinating about that is the paintings that were depicted of him, not only in photography, but the actual paintings which we'll see in the room from the First Congress to the Second Congress, was the propaganda so the people knew when they saw him all those different faces, all those people were there behind him. On the back wall, you'll see photography of the battlefields of World War I, the bunkers, the machinery, the oxen that was like pulling the machinery. In some of the other cases, then you'll see collections of the cigarette cases from the 1800s all the way up to the 1960s, along with undercups uh, which an undercup is what is used to put the glass jar in for everyone to drink their tea. And so this room, I really wanted to kind of emphasize and show how you went from the Tsars, all the elegant gowns, to World War I. And because of World War I and the revolution, fashion started to change drastically. And that's a thread that will follow throughout the entire um, exhibition. Now we're in the third room of the exhibition, and I wanted to pay particular attention, or I wanted to share uh, this painting, um, because it evokes incredible emotional responses when people from the former Soviet Union, born in a certain time frame, you know, that would, uh, whose parents would have been in World War II or grown up, or from that time period during communism, in order to get the masses to get behind the cause, whatever the cause, whatever uh, political party you're representing, whatever symbolism to let everybody know you're a part of that team or this team, whatever event you went to that you're proud of, you know, you have a medal. But there's three medals in the collection uh, that are dedicated to women, mothers, who had children. The mother of the first, second, and third degree. So the mother of the third degree means you had one to five children, you get a medal. If you had six to 10 children, you get a different medal. If you have 11 or more children, you have another medal. So if you think about those Russian films and you have all those people with all those medals, it kind of, it kind of lets everybody know like they feel they are part of what's going on. Even if part of what's going on Maybe it isn't so good. It depends on which side of the, the medal you're on. You, know, you may think the whole uh, ruling class at that time is important, but understand you have to get everybody on board. And one way to get everybody on board is to make them part of the system. Over here, you'll see porcelain pieces that were created uh, after World War II, of course, glorifying all the people who supported the war, whether it was the Navy, uh, women, the, the strong father, you know, with the, with the uh, child that he's embracing with a Nazi flag that he's standing on top of. Uh, so again, it just re-emphasizes and something for someone to purchase to say, yes, I was part of that. That was that memory. It was, it was amazing. Now we're in the fourth room, which kind of is a compilation 
of the history from the Tsar through the First World War II, and now here we are in the 1990s. And again, there's more revolution, but there seems to be even more revolution being shown because of the avail availability of travel and uh, news reports and so on. And the, the piece behind me, uh, the Orange Revolution, uh, often in my 20 years of travel to the, to the former Soviet Union, we often went to the Ukraine first. I wanted to share a story with, with the first Orange Revolution. I have a lot of friends there, a lot of, a lot of artists, and while it was happening, I got this email from them saying, you must come, you're Ukrainian, you have been supporting our country and supporting our artists and uh, producing books about Ukraine art, and we can get you behind the line, we're behind the line. And I'm emailing and saying, you know, I don't speak Ukrainian. And if it goes the wrong way, I'll be in prison. And I don't, you know, I'm not going to do well as an American. But go ahead, everybody, and just start making paintings. And so these are three of the paintings from one of the artists that I have. Uh, some of the other pieces in the room, of course, are the Velvet Revolution, which, which was the Czech Revolution what, by Hubble. Uh, again, that revolution, people just took to the streets, very peaceful, uh, all in with candles, every day, no yelling, no screaming, just marching, marching day in, day out as it were, to uh, end the rule of the current Communist Party. Another piece to talk about is the, the war rugs. So the war rugs had was between Russia and the Afghanis. And so the tribes in those areas started to weave in uh, planes and tanks and ammunition into their tribal rugs. The most interesting, if you, when I, when I look at the pieces are, you know, Matryoshkas, which are these nesting dolls. They sell them everywhere throughout, the, throughout Russia. But now they have them with all the leaders of uh, the Russian Revolution, uh, of Stalin, Lenin, uh, all the leaders, uh, Brezhnev, all the leaders, and then they have another set of all the rulers uh, from the Tsar time period. So if you go back to how, how revered both parties were in the first room, in the second and third room, they were so important, and now they're a nesting doll for the tourists to buy. They have a, they have a picture of Lenin, and they call it a McLennan, that they were, which is like a McLennan's chicken being sold at McDonald's. So think about this. A man started a revolution that toppled the Tsar. He was the founder of Marxism, which became communism. That wasn't his idea. And now he's schlepping chicken. Um, it, it's just quite interesting. We should take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. Thank you so much. And I do hope you get to see this beautiful collection. Uh, the inspiration for me for this collection and why I've collected all of these pieces, I kind of fell into it because while we were going, I was so fascinated with the former Soviet Union, all those countries, because it was, it was so different from Europe and my trips to Europe. And I, kept, I saw all this heritage, all these beautiful things that people were selling, you know, in essence, just to survive. And over... 15, 20 years, you start to really acquire a lot of things that I felt like somebody needs to preserve this. And while these are not museum pieces by any stretch of the imagination, these are kind of everyday, upper everyday, middle class, upper middle uh, pieces of art, somebody needed money, 
I wanted to preserve something, and when you turn around in 20 years, which is like a blink of the eye, you have a story, and the, a story that I think needs to be shared and, and saved. So I was asked once of my collection, of all the things I own in my home, which this is um, a small portion of, of what I have. Uh, this is under the bed or behind cabinets. You know, what piece would I grab? And it's really hard, it's really hard to say which piece, but I would have to say, oh God, I'm not leaving. <laughs> I'm staying with all of it. Oh. What piece? What piece? All of that. You know, when I look at everything that you will see in the show, every piece has a story. I, I didn't go to a shop and go, oh, I'll buy that painting or that painting. Oh, I like that tchotchke. No, I actually like kind of met the person, understood why they were selling it, what was going on or it's uh, in regards to the larger of Lenin and Stalin. I was there when like everything was going down. Like if you worked and made ketchup or pickles, or whatever factory you work with, that's how you were paid. So everyone is bartering on the streets. And so those paintings, I don't know how they got them or where they got them, but they were a hundred dollars. And I thought, you know, for $100 each piece, I should buy them. I don't know what I'm going to do with them. I'll roll them up and ship them FedEx back to America. But they had to, you know, they had to be saved. And um, so, so it's, I guess I would, I guess they, I love everything, but I guess I could have to walk away from everything because I have my memories of the stories of the pieces of art.